the Low Res Jam 2020. The challenge, make a game in 64 by 64 pixels or less. That gives a grand total of a little bit more than 4,000 pixels to work with. The 64 by 64 pixel challenge is a meager 13% of the original Atari 2600's resolution. I've always enjoyed working within small pixel confines, and pixel art is definitely my forte when it comes to the art side of game development. So this particular game jam had a certain appeal to it that I couldn't quite shake. Kinda like the appeal that C++ has to me. This was my first ever game jam that I've ever entered in, and I decided to team up with a well-known YouTuber called... Polymars. He's a fellow epic C++er, and he makes game dev videos. You should check him out. The jam started on July 31st, and submissions would be due on the 16th of August. Polymars is a rather ambitious fellow, and was currently working on a different jam until the 8th of August. I think me and Polymars both suffer from being workaholics, and we ended up with no more than 8 days to complete our submission to the jam, instead of the standard 17 days. I knew the jam deadline would be tight, because it took place right during harvest, which is the busiest time of the year for me. But, I figured we would be able to pull something off that would both look and feel nice. At least, that's what I thought before Python came along and hijacked our project, but more on that later. Polymars and I didn't have to spend any time at all deciding on a programming language to use. There was only one real option for us, and that was C++, the very best programming language on earth. The only decision we had to make was which library to use. We both had experience working with SDL2 before, with Polymars' learning SDL2 in 48 hours, and my game Farmhold that I'm currently developing, so we figured it would be a great choice. This way, we could evenly split the workload and each take half of the programming and half of the artwork. There were 10 possible themes to work with for the game, or no theme at all if you wished. Polymars and I called each other through Discord voice chat on the 31st of July to brainstorm some ideas. Alright, hello and welcome to the game jam. We need to have a hot dog in our game that looks like this. <laughs> For sure. What if we had a game where you were the hot dog inspector? <laughs> like, the hot dogs come in on a conveyor belt and then you've got to pick out the the rejects like the fingers and stuff yeah you have to inspect every <laughs> single pixel because there's only 64 pixels or 64 <laughs> by 64 pixels you have to be very careful otherwise mm -hmm. you'll upset the cri upset the critics yes yes we, we don't want that to happen oh right the mustard yeah we need the mustard <laughs> and of course some nice ketchup oh a bingo ketchup Pigs will eat just about anything, so <laughs> just remember that next time you eat a hot dog. <laughs> you, do right. you, have, you have any animals? Um, yeah, I have a cat, and I also have a dog. Oh, uh, you don't you don't eat them, do you? Uh, <laughs> not not normally. Oh wait, look at this, slippery. I feel like slippery could be combined with hot dogs. What else? Yeah. Always moving. It could be like a hot dog factory, and it's on like conveyor belts, and you have to like do stuff. Oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And so we can just yoink their idea and make it hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> make it hot dogs, but make sure you pick out the fingers and then the rats. This will change the way games are viewed forever. It'll revolutionize this medium <laughs> as a whole. Create subgenres. <laughs> oh, I see. So, so you want to drag off the bad stuff, but keep on the hot dog. <laughs> That's right. Especially if there's like a, you know, ring on the finger. If there's a ring on the finger, you definitely want to pick that out because I'll, I'll break your teeth. And then you can sell the ring. <laughs> oh, good idea. That's actually. <laughs> then you just pocket the ring. Yeah. We can have a whole in-depth economy to the game. <laughs> Where you earn like your minimum wage salary working at the factory, but then you can sell these rings and maybe even pocket the hot dogs and sell them. <laughs> you could probably sell the fingers on the black market. <laughs> even rats. 
Wait, words. if you zoom in, can you write like really tiny words? Yeah, I think so. Hmm. H E L O L O. Hidden little Easter egg for for the C++ gang right there. C++ is better than Python. Uh oh. Words of truth. Instant dislikes on this video. Oh no. Uh, what have I done? What if there were different like paths you you could take in the game? Like if you take away all the good stuff and you like perfectly only keep all the bad stuff, then you get rewarded. Ah. Uh. And there could be like, a bad ending and a good. <laughs> oh. Multiple ending. What are you, John? Where, I don't know. where I are you? you just oh, oh, where? I'm oh. Drawing, I just drew a nice, a nice brown border around this canvas. Excellent. I think this this game idea could probably work. Well, some people like, some people like rats. I I once read a book that was, a biologist was trying to. I don't know if it's a biologist, but whatever. There, they're trying to document the life of a wolf. So he's like, I need to eat rats. Because that's what wolves oh, eat. God. He might play the play this game and think that you're supposed to keep the rats on there. <laughs> Throw that nasty crap in the in the trash. That's just that's gross. Like what is that? A good hot dog? You like, ketchup? What the heck? <laughs> Who uses ketchup? Give me that delicious rat. As long as it's not gutted. After some high octane brainstorming, Polymars and I decided on an idea we thought would work. The player would be a worker in a hot dog factory and the player's chief responsibility would be to prevent fingers, rats, radioactive hot dogs, and other undesirables from making their way into the consumer's hands and eventually stomachs. This would be achieved by sorting the hot dogs into their destination bins. The crate would be for the good hot dogs and the trash bin would be for the bad hot dogs. Hot dogs and defects will pour in from the left on a conveyor belt and make their way to the incinerator at the end of the conveyor belt. Let too many food products get burned in the incinerator and you lose the game. Send too many hot dogs to the wrong destination and you'd also lose the game. The goal would be to survive as long as you can as the factory would gradually speed up. We originally planned to have a score counter to keep track of the hot dogs, but I'm fairly certain this is where Python made its infiltration. We had larger ambitions of in-game day cycles and multiple endings, but for now our priority would be implementing a working gameplay loop while keeping to the 64x64 64 64 resolution. The epic C++ coding commenced a week later. After setting SDL2 up, we entered the mines of C++ to crack out some code nuggets. To get a basic rendering system implemented, we just kiped the code from my game Farmhold and stripped it down to the bare bones to get a simple framework up and running. In addition to that, somebody put a cup of vinegar on my desk and then I, I'm kind of absent-minded regarding my cups of water I just drink. I get so many out that I thought it was mine, and so I just chugged this glass of vinegar. I'm like, what the? <laughs> and it was on my uh, desk. I was there a cup of vinegar on your desk. <laughs> That's what I wanted to know. So far, my only suspect is Python. Python must have had something to do with it. Everyone who I've interrogated regarding the vinegar just doesn't know anything they say. It's, it's the mis mystery cup of vinegar. <laughs> but it didn't quite taste like vinegar. It tastes like there's something else worse than vinegar. Like worse than you think vinegar would taste. The first challenge we faced was rendering our game to the 64 pixel resolution. It sounds somewhat backwards, but it was actually harder for us to render to less pixels than to render to a higher resolution. Nearly every pixel our game is scaled up so that one in-game pixel equates to more than one on-screen pixel. This allows you to smoothly render movement for low resolution sprites, but that would be a direct violation of the Game Jam's guidelines. Thanks to the sheer power of C++, we were able to throw together a solution fairly quickly. In our game we have a method called render, which is part of the render window class, and it takes in a game world as a parameter which contains all of the in-game sprites. The render method is responsible for drawing all of the game sprites to the screen. To lock the game to the 64x64 64 64 grid, all we had to do was round all of the sprites drawn positions to be a multiple of the camera's zoom factor. 
The function responsible for this mechanic takes in a value and a zoom as parameters, and all it does is rounds the value to be the closest multiple of the zoom factor and then returns that value. This way, all of the drawn coordinates of the sprites lock to the 64 by 64 pixel grid no matter where they are on the screen. After locking the sprites to the grid, the second issue we had was rendering only 64 by 64 pixels. We originally considered a more elegant solution of installing an SDL shape library and then creating a window shape that would be drawn on top of the game that would hide any of those rascally little sprites who weren't rendering within the 64 by 64 limit. But of course, given that we're programmers, we decided to just create a blank white sprite and then cut a hole in the middle of that and then draw that on top of the game, ensuring that no pixels get drawn outside of the limits. Everything went fairly smoothly after that until we hit a pretty massive hurdle, and that was Python. In the game, anytime a hot dog or a hot dog enters the destination bin, we decided to just delete it and then free the memory that the hot dog or hot dog was taking. To do that, we had a, you know, just, just a little, little function called delete sprite. And for whatever reason, we had mixed results when running it on Windows. Sometimes it would just completely crash, other times it would work flawlessly, and in the very rare cases, the entire game would just spin in mad directions for no real reason. Neither me or Polymars could figure out what on earth was going on, and so we kind of used Python as our scapegoat. Anytime we encountered an issue we didn't know how to deal with, we immediately blamed Python throughout the rest of the programming venture. I don't know why, but it just felt good to have something to blame for this uh, chaos. If you have a serious urge to crawl on your skin, then you're in luck because I left a link in the description to the GitHub for the project, and boy oh boy, some of this code was downright horrendous. Some of this code was absolutely the worst code I've written in my entire life. One week later on Sunday, August 16th, we did get a working prototype up and running, and that's all we had. The forecast wasn't looking too good for a project, and we barely had enough time to implement a difficulty curve. The only real extras we were able to add to our game was sounds and music. I created the music track, and Polymars did the sounds. The deadline was 5pm, which I'm certain that Polymars was grateful for, as he had been used to 5am times, which I don't know why, don't know why you would do that, that seems like a bit of a cruel move to programmers. But the deadline came and went. In the end, we were able to get a hold of one of the organizers, which was Jack, and he was a very kind, good fellow, and he let us join the jam despite the slight tardiness, just a little, just a little late. Polymars tried to get a web build working with inscription, but that didn't turn out so well. It was buggy at best if it actually worked at all, but there was some reports that it did work for some people. If it works on some machines, it works on all of them. In the end, we weren't able to implement a lot of our larger ambitions for the game, and I think that really shows when you look at the ratings for how the game did. But we ended up with 249th place overall out of 369 entries, with our best quality being the authenticity, the use of the resolution restriction, but we actually do use subpixels when the hot dogs go into the bin, when they shrink down, we actually use subpixels. I'll take it, I'll take it. Gameplay, we were ranked at 300th, which wasn't that good. For my first time out, I learned a lot. I really enjoyed doing the jam with Polymars. It's a ton of fun to code when you're coding with somebody else. The timing was probably the worst time of the year for me to do one because it's right during harvest. I had my driver's test right in the middle of my watch. <laughs> for the amount of time I was able to invest in the game, I'm really happy with how everything turned out in the end. We did get a working result that you can play, it's time to play the game. A nice classic little splash screen and the little Easter egg if you if you were able to catch it. Click to play. All right, starts it off nice and slow with you know pretty regular looking hot dogs. Nothing to be alarmed about. Nothing to really. Whoa. Is that that thing doesn't look healthy? The coloration is slightly off. That thing doesn't look very edible, if you ask me. Uh oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> that thing is. That's one shriveled looking hot dog. And a rat. I mean, maybe a finger we might have been able to slip. You know, a finger? Maybe. But a rat? 
he, he, I don't know. Alright, maybe someone should call the health inspector here, because this is... These hot dogs are not looking good. I'm pretty sure there's some cross-contamination happening here. Yum, yum, mmm. A pig foot, oh boy. And that one's the moldy hot dog, and oh. Okay, that's a live, that is a live rodent. This one looks like he's a bit of, it's a rodent carcass. That one was a live rodent. So, it starts off slow, but, and it, it gradually speeds up, and it does get faster. And that is a nuclear hot dog. Someone should probably install a Geiger counter here, because this just feels slightly unsafe. <laughs> okay, it's actually starting to get a little bit faster now. So there's 10 levels of speed for it. Well, I've... For, and whenever you go from level 7 to uh, 8, it just jumps right up very quickly. So you can't really relax for long in this game. Yum yum, more hot dogs. Alright, oh okay, I think this is the speed that it just gets really fast for no real reason. <laughs> this is not- okay, that's- that's the one- no! Guess I got fired from the hot dog factory. So you see, when you lose, it, the game just quits because we didn't have time for a game over screen. If any of you want to play the game, link down in the description. Some of the people are finding it through the horror tag. It counts as a horror game, which <laughs> I find kind of funny because there's like fingers and other oddities in it. So let me know in the comments if you found the hidden Easter egg in the game. Thank you all for watching the video and being patient for me to get it out there. It took me forever to do it. I hope you like the editing in it because I now believe I know what it feels like to go through labor. Stay tuned for more videos. Make sure you subscribe to Polymars. Code like gophers and I will see you in the next video. After a quick word from our sponsor, Mick Van Bach. It's finally out. You can get the book Mick Van Buck Call of the Lighter on Amazon today. Mick Van Buck Call of the Lighter is a hilarious book written by my dad, Peter and Mast. Mick Van Buck is hilarious, and that's a fact. In fact, I would say funniest book of the year, in my, in my opinion. Let's just read the back a second here. Bam. As Mr. Brown knocked on our front door, the smell from outside came wafting in through the open window, hitting my nose, making my knees wobble. Joy, hesitating, sucked in some air and began to hold her breath before letting the rank old farmer and his fog of death into the house. The door was hardly open before Mr. Brown's foot appeared in the crack of the door, just in case Joy was going to change her mind about letting him in. As he took a seat at her table and I poured him some coffee, I said, You've been skinning some skunks, I see. And I thought to myself, it must have been a ripe rotten skunk. The stink so rank that it could peel the paint off the walls and a layer of flesh off of my eyeballs. He replied, No, just that dandy sized skunk last month. Why do you ask? We're really happy with how the book turned out. The cover has a nice mate finish, which we were super happy with. Cover that cover just sucks you right in. And it comes jam-packed with over 15 pictures. I think it was like 23 pictures or something like that, or 19. I don't remember the exact number, but it comes jam-packed with illustrations. What's that you say? How can you get the book? Well, a link in the description will take you right to the Amazon page. And for $14.95 American dollars, you can own Mick Van Buck Call of the Lighter today. Laughter is guaranteed.